the, this project fits in and sort of meshes into quite a few of the things that are happening and the, quite a few historical things. Um, and I, I think at, to start off, we were talking yesterday, um, not to fetishise Block too much, but we were talking about... I didn't realise he was being fetishised. I wish it was the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started off chatting about, um, about stories. Um, block wrote a book called Traces, which is a sort of sequence of small stories. And I was saying to you, in the car, it's like when I'm in a pub with people, I always say, oh, it's like when, it's like, do you remember? It's like when, and people sort of go, no. Like, it's like when the dog ran off and we had to chase it and we caught it down the street. And, and people say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. But I think I wanted to start today off with a story. And I think it's about the Adventure Playground and the, the, the kind of call for proposals around utopia and funding came before the project, obviously. Um, so I don't think it's a shoehorn, but when I was thinking about utopian, utopian imagination, I thought about the Adventure Playground, and we have to go a long way back, probably to about 1996. And the, the playground then, it seems to be sunny when I'm down there at the minute, and maybe I've just become a hopeless romantic, but recently it's been quite sunny. But it always seemed to be quite grey, and I was sat with my friend um, Angie, who we both had small children, I was a dad at home. And I was like saying, I don't think I can cope coming down here anymore. It's just like horrible. It's really grey. It's really dark. There's not much happening. And the kids always hurt themselves. And she sort of gave me this little like, lesson in life, which is a bit of a lesson, I think, in, in the utopian imagination. And she said, oh, you've not, you've not worked it out. You can't just enjoy coming down here. You've got to teach yourself to love it. Because it is actually quite horrible at times. And horrible stuff's going to happen. But if you teach yourself to love it, then you can forgive it for all the things that are wrong, all the problems with it, and you can fall in love with it, and then you can really enjoy being there. And I think over the years, that's something that really stuck with me about lots of different things, the actually properly, fully engaging with something. So yeah, I don't love taking my kids swimming, but I quite enjoy it, it's all right, and I do it. But actually, you have to, I did sort of loathe going to playgroups as the only man for maybe 12 years, and I had to teach myself to not just try and think, well, that's something to do, but to really love it. And I think that's the same with the Adventure Playground. So I think, in a way, that's when we sort of saw the call for funding opportunities around Utopia. I kind of, I thought, um, that's, maybe that fits on a very personal level. And we talked yesterday a lot about where the personal fits in with the political, because I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of personal stuff going on at the Adventure Lego within this project for me and a lot of history and I do lots of work nationally, internationally and it's, this is like, so I load my car up with stuff and like, you know, last year I'd have been driving off to Nottingham or Manchester with the same stuff and I just sort of go around the corner <laughs> and I'm sort of there and it feels very different. So for me it's kind of really interesting to have this kind of work, theoretical, what's that noise? Theoretical and sort of thinking about utopia, it's sort of been researched in a strange kind of research way. It's sort of working with architecture and education, but just down the street with people that I've known. I mean, I sort of probably sat with... When did you go to the playground? 98? 2000? When your hair was blonde. <laughs> 1992. 1994. 1994. Yeah, I first arrived, so I probably was sat there in 1994. Yeah. So it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting personal journey for me that then collides with days like today, which is, I feel quite unusual, really, to all be sat around here. Quite nice to have this discussion, but I think that idea of, of praxis, where does play theory, where does, where does it actually fit in? Where does block thinking utopia? And I'm, I'm Rushdie, a young man interviewed me on camera and he asked me about the project and what, I, what my aspirations were for it. Well, he didn't say aspirations, he said, what's it going to be like? And I, sort of, I said, oh, I'm a bit worried about it. And he said, why? And I said, I'm worried because I think people might think we're being ironic because, you know, what we actually make and what we do, maybe people won't be able to see it because I'm winkered because I've taught myself to love it. So I've, sort of, I've got a time-lapse film of, of the playground and like, maybe somebody here might watch it and say, look, oh, there's a six-year-old there and he's not been looked after or what are those kids doing around the back or so different lenses that people might bring I just go wow look at that look at all them people running around like ants doing stuff being busy all been there because they want to be there so I think that's maybe why we need to frame it so to be careful that doesn't get taken somewhere else 
Mm. And somebody say, look, look, that kid, if you focus in, he's not his nappy changed for four hours. So that's kind of how that stuff went over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we visited a playground yesterday, um, and that was very interesting. We had a look around. I don't know if any, how many of you know the place, but it's a very, uh, very exciting playground, which is, has a real community feel about it. Um, and it comes out of this, well, we heard this yesterday, it comes out of this tradition of the adventure playground, this concept going back to the first decades after the Second World War, when there was, uh, from Scandinavia, yeah? But the, where there was this idea that there needed to be a, a space where, where children could explore freely, and where play was not organized in a way. And I think that atmosphere was very much there. So we, we, we got a really good experience of, of that. My experience was, Having also raised children in the in the in the the twenty first century, that um, it it was for me it was a, a, a remembrance of the way I experienced play myself when I was a child, just this roaming around. You know, you you you, you left. Us. I, I grew up in the Netherlands, in in a village, and you just left ha left home with on a bike, and you just uh, were cycling were cycl cycling around all day, and nobody looked after you and. You just discovered what you what you wanted to discover, and um, I think that's a sense of play that that uh, we are losing more and more. Yeah? Play is just to be organised. Children, uh, uh, we are afraid that something happens to children when you when you let them go, etc., etc. So there's something changing in our culture with respect to how we how we think about the child, and um, and I think it was a very interesting experience yesterday to find a place. For me, it was a space where something that was more familiar to me in terms of my history and, and, and how I experienced my own childhood uh, than, than a lot of the things that I see in, in other places today when I look at spaces that have been designed for children uh, to, to, to play in. So that, that is, is a, an interesting thing and it made me think, um, and that's I think the, the title of, of this morning session, what is the relation between play and utopia? Because that's really what we're, what we're here to discuss. So. Um, how can we understand play better if we think about utopia as a concept, as an idea? And how can we understand utopia better when we, if we think about play? What have they got to do with each other? You know, why why even talk about <laughs> talk about the relationship between the two? And there's a lot to say about that, um, but I'm not going to do that because otherwise I'll be talking all the time. <laughs> Um, so I hope that we can sort of, in a more dialogic way, uh, try to get a bit of a sense of, of what is really going on here. I think it's, um, I think there's a, there's a very deep relation between the two. They, they are not, it's not just, a, it's not just a, an arbitrary connection that you can make. Uh, and I think um, uh, from the point of view of thinking about utopia as an idea, the, the, the idea of play corrects a lot about potential mistakes that, or, or traps that we can fall into when we try to make sense of the idea of utopia. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit when, uh, when uh, uh, Cathy comes in about um, Thomas More, where I think you can see that. Um, and on the other hand, I think when you, um, uh, I think the same applies the other way around. I think the idea of utopia can tell us something essential about play but we have to understand it in the correct way. And um, uh, maybe one place to start is to say, what, there is a, uh, play can be very serious. And, and, uh, and, and, and seriousness can also be very playful. Yeah? Um, and I think if you re remember your own experiences playing as a child, you know, you remember very well that, that the that, that seriousness of play. <laughs> You know, that everything depends on it in a way. Um, and um, uh, I hope that, you know, as you grow up, that sometimes you can also experience that seriousness can be, can be very playful. And I think that these two things have to be kept in mind, as it were. There's a di dialectical relation between the two. Um, in terms of utopian literature, we're going to talk about that maybe later on, but I just wanted to say this now. It's this famous text, I don't know if, how many people of you know, know this by Thomas More, Utopia, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, which, which is a, a document published 500 years ago, 1516, 
in which Thomas More, humanist scholar, um, invents this word utopia. And, um, and he, it's a word play, um, but you know all this, but it, it's a word play from Greek. It has topos in it, which means uh, place. And then the U is both uh, the Greek U, which means not, and the Greek U, which means good. So utopia is a non-place, which is a good place. Uh, it's a place in the imagination. It's where we go to when we when we orientate ourselves where we want to go. And this book was was written as a as a it's a very sarcastic, ironic book. It was written as a critique of of English society at the time, a critique that that Moore could not um, uh, uh, write down straight because we would have had his head chopped off, which happened in the end anyway. But um, he he couldn't do that, so he had to invent a way of speaking indirectly. And he did this in, in the form of a story about somebody coming to Britain um, who, who had been to an island, which is an island just like Britain, but it's much better. <laughs> and so he, 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 he puts the two uh, next to each other, and then it leaves it to the reader to conclude, yeah, what, what's a very, uh, rhetorically very clever, very clever trick. And um, you might, but it's very, Thomas More is a very serious person. He, he used to, uh, like, uh, like medieval monks used to do, he used to wear a very rough uh, uh, shirt underneath his clothes that, that tore open his skin so that he would suffer the, all his life uh, and, and he did that until he died this kind of self, uh, self, self harm we would call it today <laughs> as a spiritual practice he was a very very stern um, a person um, and yet this book is very playful and it, there's a lot of humor in it and it would use, uh, there's a laugh, uh, a laugh a minute as it were uh, <laughs> Um, so you, what, what you see in this text is that um, he is, um, well, yeah, yeah, I always, my own mind always get it wrong, but I think he's very playful about seriousness. Um, so he has a very serious point to make. He, he says, he says to, to, to the reading public, you know, Britain, you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, but he does it in a very playful way. And another utopian text that we worked a lot on in the fishing project here, where we where we we went fishing with uh, with uh, young people who were uh, looked after by the oh, that's you, by the, the the youth service in in, in Rotherham, um, is a, a text from a little bit later, Thomas More's 1516, Isaac Walton's The Complete Angler, which is uh, it's the under title of subtitle of that is um, uh, the contemplative man's recreation. And it's kind of pastoral idyll. It talks about going out to the countryside, the experience of nature, this kind of becoming one with the, the, the harmonies and the rhythm of nature. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful tale about living in a natural, spontaneous way. Um, so it's all about play, but it's all about play in a very serious way. So these two, these two examples of thinking about how to organize the state in such a way that a better society is possible. What sort of rules, discipline, law do you need? Uh, that's Thomas More. And on the other hand, there is this, this image of returning to nature and finding kind of natural spontaneity in a kind of playful angling as a, as a kind of sport, as a, as a playful thing. But treating that in a very serious way, saying that's really the, where we should be going. So you've got you've got the, the the playful seriousness and the serious play, um, and these are two utopian images. I think these. So when we think about utopia, we shouldn't think about 1984, uh, you know, uh, 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 brave new world, these sorts of things. They are maybe that sort of utopian thinking. What we normally call utopian thinking is um, being too serious about seriousness. Uh, and, uh, uh, and or not or or um, you can't be playful. Yeah, you can be playful about play. We have to think about that. What that would mean. But um, you can see that. Well, that's what I wanted to say to you. That in terms of this relation between play and, and seriousness, you can see that there are different ways of of dealing with our desires, dealing with our longings, dealing with our hopes, and um, maybe that is also one of the things that we can learn from thinking about this relation between play and utopia, what have they got to, to say to each other, that um, when, when, we, uh, when we think about the playing child, uh, we, we, uh, 
we get very serious about it. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, a lot of you are working on, on, on this topic. Um, and that, that can take different forms. It can take the form of um, what is playing good for. You know, what is it like somebody was working, I just heard somebody said working on playing communication. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, how can children, you know, become better communicators if they play, etc. Um, so there is kind of, and I'm not saying that that's not <laughs> true, <laughs> but there is a kind of functional view of play. Play is for something, and that's that's true. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, um, but 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 trying to put yourself in the position of the playing child, um, what does it look like there? Um, uh, and, and maybe there, this idea of utopia can, can, can help us to articulate that a little bit. Um, there are many dimensions to it. Play is not, is not one thing. But um, the, the playing child, if you look, if you think of the adventure playground, where you have the, you have the, 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 the harbor, yeah, where, 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 where a ship might, uh, might dock. Yeah? It's, just, it's, just, it's like a, a stag, we say in Dutch, a K. Yeah, what's the word for it? A pier. A pier, yeah, that's right. It's a pier, it's got these white uh, tires hanging, hanging on from it, and there's a bit of a ditch. So you could imagine children standing on this on this pier and, 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 and imagining that a ship comes in, and there's a kind of, you know. Um, and it seems to me that, that the child at play has the same dialectic between play and seriousness that, that we talked about uh, just before. Because uh, there is no ship there, and the child, the child that's playing knows very well there is no ship. Uh, still, it can become very serious. But what happens uh, and, and, and the kind of the kind of play that is acted out, and at the same time, I think that's maybe maybe interesting to think about. At the same time, the child um, is relating to something that might be. I think we very often tend to think about a child caught up in play. Um, as not relating anymore to the fact that he or she is a child at play. We tend to think, oh, they're absorbed in their play, and it becomes the distinction between reality and play disappears. But maybe it doesn't. May maybe uh, f for, the, for the child at play, it's very much the case that uh, so the child plays being a pirate or whatever. Let's say, take an example. Yeah? Um, the child doesn't know that, knows that he or she is not a pirate, wants to be a pirate. Yeah? really wants to be a pirate or you know like very small children playing uh, 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 playing house or playing mother and father or something like that they, they, there's desire there one day I will be a mother one day I will be a father um, so and that's not just preparing for it so that when the time comes you have already rehearsed it rehearsed the script I think there's more to it I think there's really a, 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 a uh, uh, reaching forward towards something that might be the case. So, um, in 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 the child's play, there is this utopian moment. There is this moment of relating to something that might be the case, but that isn't the case. And so, the the play is playful also in that way. It's not just playing in the in the sense of spontaneous activity. It's also play in the sense the child know the child knows that what I'm playing is not real, but it might be real. So playing becomes a kind of enactment of a daydream. The play is, is, is the daydream acted out. Um, and the daydream, well, we're not going to go into the daydream. But um, uh, uh, so, yeah, the, the, the play is daydream acted out, and, and the play has got this openness within it. The child, the, the, the relation between play and reality, that, that, that difficult thing, is is in in the child's play is there as as a gap as a, as a like we say as the play in the wheel yeah? there is it's not tight there is an opening and in that opening something can shine in as, as Bloch says in in our childhood something shines in a light shines into our childhood of a place where we've never been um, and and that later on provides an orientation in life yeah. So I think that uh, that might help us to begin to think a little bit about how can thinking about utopia help us to understand play a bit better, and how can mm -hmm. thinking about play help us to understand uh, utopia a bit better, and why the two need each other, and why we are doing the wrong thing maybe if we 
uh, discount utopian thinking as wishful thinking, pie in the sky, not realistic, you shouldn't be doing it, which I think has become almost a, a dominant uh, characteristic of not just European culture, but, but uh, the global culture more and more, um, and uh, is killing our democratic societies, is killing politics. It's, it's a, it's a, that's, it's, I think there's a real, real problem there at a sort of a larger scale. The disappearance of imaginative, playful thinking, utopian thinking, is really sort of har harming the set, some of the central structures and institutions that we have for living together. Education being one of them. So we can we could also talk about what of play and utopia got to offer education. That would be an interesting topic for 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 the discussion maybe. Um, I've been reading a book about uh, recently about uh, uh, Chinese philosophy and trying to connect um, Bloch's or the, the, the utopian philosophy more and more to ideas of, of Taoism and natural spontaneity. And they might seem to be very much at odds at first because well, from what I'm understanding reading now about it is that in, in the idea of Taoism there is a strong idea of becoming one with what, if, what is the case and not thinking about how might we change the world. But maybe that is not entirely true. Um, Dutch sinologist uh, Christ Christopher Schipper, who is, is quite well known in, in these uh, areas, has written a book about about the, the religion of Taoism, where he where he talks about um, the fact that for traditional Taoist thought, the the the, the, the climax of life, the, <laughs> the, the 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 high point of life, is the moment of being born because that's where you are most alive. <laughs> that's where you are most spontaneous and you're not thinking about what you want to be or, or how you have to be. And from there on, it's, it's downhill. It's downhill. <laughs> <laughs> until, <laughs> and until you become so rigid that you die. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so therefore, this, 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 the classic Chinese philosopher of Taoism, Lao Tse, or Lao Tzu, um, is 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 is, the, is is called the old man, but also the old child, and, um, and 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 a lot of the meditative practice is directed at going back, not going forward, but going back to that that ultimate moment of being born, or your life before birth, which is there as well, uh, in the womb, and then your life after, in in the world where that moment is relived really as a moment of of, of pure spontaneity, as it were. And that seems to me to be um, a very beautiful image of how, for us, when we think about child's play and, and the child and being the child and becoming the child, how, how that also has got something to say to us. So there's also an opportunity for us to think about, yeah, we can also, as adults, be in that adventure playground. <laughs> and, you know, maybe there's an element of play for us as well about it. And maybe that's that was kind of utopian uh, utopian vision, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, th these are my thoughts at the moment, and may maybe we can uh, maybe we can just talk a little bit about what your what your views or your thoughts are about um, how these two things hang together, mm -hmm. and whether whether there is any connection that is meaningful or not, and uh, what you might be able to do with it also in your own studies and your own work. So, yeah, is that okay? Shall yeah, I leave I think it that's now? great. I yeah. think there's lots of people here who will have things to say. Darren? Yeah, um, so for me, the concept of utopia um, is a societal, we're just kind of reimagining society. Yeah. It's a, so Thomas More is the archetype, go for the genre of re the imaginary reconstitution of society, is what we call it. Yeah. Generally. And so in Ernst Bloch, when he was talking about daydreams, said that most daydreams are escapist fantasy and need to be trained and educated to focus on something beyond escapist fantasy. So link them with a political project for wider societal change. But most daydreams are just reimagining your own position within society as it's presently structured. You're imagining your own position better. Social structures remain unchanged. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what, in your mind, the link between your study of play and the kind of the wishful daydreaming that goes on with play. And if you're using Bloch as a sort of foundation for a study of concepts of utopia, 
and how that links in with Locke's much broader political notion of utopianism as having to link those daydreams and educate them and train them to focus on something that stretches beyond the individual and focuses on kind of wider structural political change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of, yeah, that's a very big topic, yeah. Um, so D Bloch speaks about what he calls doc docta spes, which means a learned hope. You have to learn how to hope. Mm. Don't, so you don't, it's not something that, that you do right uh, the sp spontaneously, maybe, I might say. Um, uh, and it's a very interesting term, it has a long history, Dr. Dr. Space, but we're not going to go into that now. But um, he, certainly, he certainly makes a distinction in, uh, in his book, The Principle of Hope, a very classical distinction between night dreams and day dreams and says night dreams are, he takes a very classic psychoanalytic viewpoint, night dreams are, um, you know, there are repressed uh, experiences or wishes or things that didn't go right in the day or things you would have wanted if you wanted to hit someone in the, in the face or something and you couldn't do it, and then it comes out in, in, in the night dream. You work through it in a certain way, because you displace it, give a symbolic interpretation of it, you might dream that you're falling downstairs or something, but it's, you know, that sort of thing, and he says it's very different from daydreaming. Daydreaming is uh, is active. Daydreaming is um, is never just something that happens to you. You engage in it. So you're sitting there, indeed, like you say, it's uh, exactly right. Sitting there thinking, if only I had a bigger car, yeah, then everything would be fine. Or if I had a better job, or if I was the the, the, the prime minister. Or <laughs> I don't know what sort of makes sense more about me that I these are the examples <laughs> I gave, but <laughs> but um, that so but but what he then says I think or that was what I would say was what I would say the the crucial point is that they are active that that the daydream is always concerned with what you could do what might be a real thing that you could do going on holiday or you know. A, 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 getting a new relationship or whatever this is about what you can do so it's already related to acting and um, and that's why for him in his general psychology every kind every act that we do starts with this kind of daydreaming that's why reverie daydreaming is so important it's it's the it, it's the, the starting point of actively transforming the world so yes it has to be critiqued because a lot of it is wishful thinking but at the same time this this pure spontaneity is always has always got to be there you can't do without it and if you think about applying it to sociology or applying it to, to politics then I think f from from certainly from my perspective I would say yes but this this daydream has always got to be there Otherwise, you, you can't define any kind of valuable project. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's got to be critiqued, and, and, and it's especially in terms of education, maybe, what has to be critiqued is the way that our capacity for daydreaming is also used and abused by, by powers of structure, powers of domination. How, for example, children from a very early age are being indoctrinated by the mantra of... Um, you go to school so that you learn skills that you can outcompete others with on a job market so that you can become richer than they are. And, and that, that is a kind of hijacking of the capacity for daydreaming. So in order to, to build a real community that is of citizens that are able to withstand that sort of critique, you have to allow them a lot of time to play <laughs> so that they, they, they know what it is and they know what real daydreaming is, and so they cannot be hijacked. They cannot be hijacked so easily. So I'm not saying that what you're saying is not right. I'm just saying that these two things need need each other in a way. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Day daydreaming is absolutely fundamental and foundational for, for Block. Utopia was a political project. It was about transforming the world, which means transforming the existing power relations. Yeah. Um, you know, transforming the mode of production, essentially. And although those small daydreams <coughs> are the beginning point, they're not the end point. So have to be critiqued and built on the last project. Yeah, yeah, of okay. utopia. yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that's true. But I want to say I want to add one more thing to it. So on the one hand, I think daydreaming, as you said, is always there. On the other hand, I think certainly for Bloch, uh, or certainly for me, 
utopia is much more than, uh, than only a political project. It is also a political project. Key example, Thomas More and, 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 and everything that happened after that. But it is much more than that. There are utopias of the body. There are utopias of um, uh, uh, our uh, of psychonautic existence. There are utopias of medicine. There are utopias of, of, of art. There are utopias of love. Um, so the, for me, this concept, the utopian, points to the, the what he calls the not yet, that things things are caught up in a, in a movement towards something else, something better, something that they might be, something that realizes their potential. And that's not just a political thing. So that's, I don't, I don't know what you think about that, but that's what I think what's important for Bloch. I just wanted to say, I mean, in, on the playground, we're, I can see the link with utopia, and it, it's a, a new concept in some respects, yeah. uh, in terms of looking at what we're offering. Um, but we try to put in things into the environment that children can use to extend their imaginations and be more playful. But what was really interesting when we first took over the playground, and it had been run down for a while and not, the attendance wasn't very high at the point we took over, as we got children coming on, I think things I'd read about that... Um, children don't play anymore, it's all about education, it's passing the sats, it's all this sort of stuff. And that's all about what, what we should be doing with children and using play as an educational tool. But we found that children, and I hate saying it because <laughs> it goes against what I believe, in that they didn't know how to play on the playground. And they yeah. would ask us, and I actually felt we were in the position of having to show them how to play. Mm -hmm. And it struck me how far removed we've come and what a disservice society as a whole are doing to children, yeah. and ultimately to society as a whole in the long term. So we're trying to book that trend, and we're trying to you know, get those playful opportunities there, get the daydreaming, get those ideas are there. And we do struggle, is that our agenda as an, as an adult? Is that my agenda? Am I coming with that? Or is it the children's agenda? And there's always that balancing act to, to provide. We're trying to put into practice those ideas that you're talking about. Yeah. We're trying to translate that into the reality on the ground. Well, it's children. like the, we went to the Eastbourne Conference, didn't we, mm. National Play, and one of the um, speakers, was it Jess? Jess mm. Yeah. East talks about adulterization, and it's stuck in my head. Um, mm. Basically, where it's it's um, you can't adulterize kids. Children have to come on. It, it's like the utopia concept. Mm. You know, they've got these imaginations. You have to yeah. let it mm. come out through play. Yeah. Otherwise, it's it then becomes adulterization because you are instilling in what these children into these children in what you think mm. they should be doing through play mm. i don't know it's just as you were speaking it it's popped up into yeah. my head i can't yeah, it's very it's, interesting yeah do you think yeah. do you no, think no. that this I, I think a lot about um the talk with the, the, the about being able to play and I, as a chess player i played chess for sort of spells of my life kind of a club level when i was younger and then i played you know the odd game and then i taught my son to play and we played a lot and I can almost feel a bit of my brain, like my chest brain, that's really lazy and sloppy as I start playing over about two weeks a bit more intensively. It kind of comes back like a muscle that I've got to exercise. And I, and I work really hard at being able to play, and I play with my kids. I'm a sort of plays really, not in a kind of, I wouldn't overtly talk about it, but I think I essentially, I do try and create playful spaces like the work I do in architecture. And it's, I always try and do it through entering the, the space of play as an adult. And in a way, I think there's a coming together. So it's not so much adulterization as the kids t reminding you how to play and being able to play together. And I know that that's not probably what the play workers think or what anyone thinks should happen. I don't. <laughs> but, but, but that is kind of, in terms of, so I think, you know, like the work that's happening at the event to play again at the minute, it's kind of, we went and we got loads of willow, and then Patrick, as an artist working there, is building things, and young people are joining in, and I, and that's kind of fits my idea of 
and what we've got no idea what will emerge from that, and it's a combination of people working together. Whereas you could kind of been a bit more, you could have an idea that you weren't structuring and saying, this is all going to, let's all sit down and think, what we're going to do with this? And let's get some post it stickers, you all do a design, or we'll make a democratic sort of system. But it's kind of about just stuff evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the role of the adults in that, as play workers, it is a bit different to maybe an artist or a parent or an adult mm -hmm. or someone who's just there joining in. I and there's this joining in this. So I think, in a way, the playground offers the space and the not really rules, but some kind of structure. Well, and then, I, I also yeah, think, Steve, that each play worker it comes from backgrounds as well. Um, because this. Where we are, there's, there's, there's several play, play workers, volunteers and stuff. Um, some have got kids and some don't have children. So working with Tate Julius, he's not here, mm. his idea of what play is, because he hasn't got children, is not the same as mine. So it depends who you are as well, what your background is, and how you see play, mm. and how you see taking play forward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there's right and the wrong. No, no, I'm just saying just, it, I don't think it's very easy for adults, like Johan was saying, we all have to remember play or whatever. As an adult that spends a lot of time trying to remember how to play, mm. I don't think that I do it very well. Mm. I don't think I understand play. What you all need well. to do is come on the playground for 24 hours, <laughs> then you'll be alright. Speaking about being a, an adult and, and playing is. Um, there's a couple of things from what you were saying, Johan, that was, was really useful. Um, but one of the things that um, I've been thinking about recently is we've been there's this uh, approach called counter tourism. Uh, there's a guy he's called he calls himself Crab Man, but he's actually like an associate professor at Portsmouth University. And his whole approach is is about going to heritage sites and and kind of moving away from just the very sanitised view of history. He go, here's your notes about what this this is, this kind of Anglo-Saxon artifact or whatever. And he has all these tactics counter-tourism tactics and then um, the things like I don't know go to a heritage site and just be offended by everything or imagine that you're walking around the whole place on a very thin sheet of ice or um, one of the weirdest ones is imagine you're looking at, at the place as if you're just a pair of dragon's eyes not through a pair of dragon's eyes but just a pair of dragon's all these really weird things but what's really fun about it is it's very silly and it seems a bit strange but his whole point is about don't just take these views of what the history history is. You know, hi history has multiple perspectives and and various things. And by acting through these things, performing them, being a bit si being a bit playful, something very serious comes out of it. A kind of sideways look at what's going on, look, looking at the past differently, and, and reimagining your relationship with the the space that, that you're in. And it's kind of funny because they keep kind of talking about them and having lots of fun with them. And people just think well, you're just being a bit silly. And actually, it's quite serious, and it's, it's a really enjoyable thing to do as well. But I don't know, I think that's maybe just thinking seriously about play as an adult and having people thinking, <laughs> not taking it seriously. So I don't know, it's just quite fun. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, that, that's tricky. There's a, there's a lot of tension there. I, I, I there was writers like Joan Huizinger who wrote the Homo Ludens in in the 50s and yeah. then there's Roger Carr's but and they can get taken both ways you know so you were talking about children now of, of being like adult made into adults thinking about competition and mm. achievement and it, these writers are trying to introduce play to adults but it goes both ways you know you can end up so Huizinger's ideas were adopted by a lot of revolutionaries in, in, in France and things but then it also goes through to people like Richard Florida and the creative class and it's all about making money, you know, we're, we're playful but we're still kind of... Google sort of... Yeah, make, make, yeah. Situationists, uh, yeah. So it's yeah. The, both stemming from the same same ideas of, 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 of the lost kind of dimension of play. Yeah. And so That's right, that, I mean that goes back to the first point that you can, you, yeah, you can take it in, in both directions. It can be something that can be, uh, yeah. It's it's not guaranteed that we that we play in the right way or that we or that we get the right context to play. It can be used and misused. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like yeah, we've got the big slide at the workstation down 
in town, but it, you've still got like like deadlines and hiring and firing. You're not allowed to go down it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a safety. You have to have a heart yeah. thing on to, to make sure you're not going to have a heart. Yeah. But, 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 but bum on it and then I came down. Uh, but, uh, that, that is an example, maybe, of where you can say, yeah. So, so play and utopia need each other. Yeah, you need. You need you need to have this this critical imagination in order to to get the right attitude towards play, and and the other way around. Yeah. I think Heisinger is a very interesting example in that respect, also himself, because I think he he approached play like a proper lad professor in a very dry <laughs> way, but uh, but nevertheless he he said very very good things about it. Yeah. 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 Interested in what you were saying about <clears throat> the, some of the apparent contradictions in play. So, play can be serious, and serious activity can be playful. And just maybe extending that, um, one of the things that I find interesting is um, that we tend to associate play with being fun um, and happy. Um, but conversely, and I'm sure that you can speak for this, um, play can sometimes be painful and horrible, and yeah. you know. I wouldn't necessarily say a negative experience, but associated with what we might think of as negative emotions. And I was thinking, I, I don't know much about um, utopian theory, um, but it kind of resonates with some of the things I've looked at. And I've, I've, in my research with children talking about their perspectives of play, um, children tend to play not as individuals, but connected with, with other children, so in a community. And I wondered even if, one child's utopia might be another child's dystopia. <laughs> yeah, in some ways. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. What you thought about that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yes, I think the whole spectrum of of uh, of, of human emotions is is mm. is exercised and activated in, in play. Mm. That's that's obvious. Yeah. And play can be no fun at all, and can can yeah can cause damage. And and uh, uh, that's right. That's all there. Yeah. Mm. Um, so what's the role of the adult in that? Yeah. Um, yeah. The kind of the authority figure, because I was, I was imagining the same thing. So I imagine that uh, you know, it fits more that um, some kids don't get to play on the equipment they want. Some kids are bullied. <coughs> some kids are excluded from group games. And you know, society as adults experience it is actually partly reproduced through play. There's all sorts of power relations and exclusions right. and, and yeah. oppressions going on there. Um, so what's the role of the adult then? in guiding the children on how to play correctly without imposing a kind of socially constructed norm about what appropriate play should be. Can you that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what you're trying to do is teach children about life skills in the world, aren't you? We've got a whole set of governing structures like in society whether we like it, we don't have to adhere to. And what we try to do is to provide a free, open space. That's the starting point. Try to not intervene as often as in other environments and states. Uh, and when the disagreements and there's issues and there's problems, obviously we address it and we talk it through with the groups. Uh, and generally you come to a consensus. And a lot of the time, the children resolve the problems themselves. Yeah, on the that's right. Yeah. We've come a long way on our journey in two or three years. Uh, and it is about play frames and how you work collectively and the difference within your team and your organisation. Mm -hmm. We have pretty standard practice what's acceptable and what's not. But yesterday, talking with Kate, Steve, and Johan, it's very limited in terms of the rules mm. what we have. It's a free open space where children can be what they want to be. It's um, it's knowing when, when to leave it and let them sort it out and when we need to intervene. Mm. Um, and we've talked about this with other people that work on adventure playgrounds across the country. And, and everybody struggles with it at times. And, it, and everybody says it differs from person to person. Uh, different play workers, some will intervene sooner than somebody else will. And a lot of that is about confidence <coughs> and experience. And so it is a journey for everybody on that. And sometimes you get it wrong, but a lot of the time you get it right. Um, that's what I've noticed. When I, was I think that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. I think as play workers you learn it's different every session, no session is ever the same. Mm. The children, the audience you're getting is never the same. Yeah? 
you might see one kid this week and you don't see him again for three weeks and in, in that space time you've got another four come on that you don't know that well it's a case of you don't have a set dealing with a, a situation it's it's as of and when mm -hmm. you're there and something might go wrong like patrick said nine times out of ten kids resolve it itself because if you if you try and step in most of the time you look like the idiot because 10 minutes later <laughs> They're playing pirates at the back of the field and you're stood there going, what? Oh. So it's just as of and when, really. There's no, the kids don't, they don't really have rules there. The, 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 the rules that are made for kids on there is such as like, well, you know the kitchen shuts at quarter past six, don't be coming asking me for a drink. That's just one thing, but we don't have rules during play. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think also everybody who's, who raises children will recognise yeah. that when, yeah. when they're fighting. You know, unless blood flows, you've got to let them sort it out themselves. Yeah. So, well, I've yeah. learned that a bit too late because I've got four kids and I never watched my kids fight. I'd be, no, you're not doing that. But now on the playground, it's, I think very differently. I'd be, yeah. all right, leave them for 10 minutes. Whereas yeah. in my household, I want to do it. So I'm learning, I'm still learning, yeah. despite having four adult kids of my own, I'm still learning with this utopia and play exactly, thing as well. Yeah. So. It's relationships and it's understanding the children and understanding where they're coming from and how they interact themselves. So one child might be a certain way with another child that might spark off mm. a fight, but they might act the same way with somebody else and it doesn't. Mm. And it's, it's knowing that and that's the skill of the play workers and their skills at observing and getting to know the children as to that those understanding the facts of communication again. Mm -hmm. It's how the children communicate with each other uh, in lots of ways, verbally, physically, and all those sorts of things. And play workers are thinking on the feet all the time. Or well, they should be. But they should never stop thinking because that's the nature. And you'll notice Patrick and myself, our eyes are all over the place when we're on the playground mm -hmm. because we're just constantly monitoring what's happening in all the corners. So we might not be behind the building where the kids are doing something, but I've got an ear to it. Yeah. You know, and, and listening is, is a good skill as well because it, the, the te tone of the noise changes if it's going to get. Mm. That's right. The mood. I think that's true. And that, yeah. um, but as you were speaking, I was thinking about it, that, that mm -hmm. um, so we also use the word play in a very negative, sometimes in negative mm -hmm. ways. We say you're, you're playing around, or you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, or you're playing around with me, or whatever. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, it can be, and then the tone changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we might also say in this kind of situation, we might say to children, mm -hmm. now you're not playing anymore. Now it's mm -hmm. become something else. It's become a bullying or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah? So there is a kind of fi very fine line. It's not to say that there can be no struggle in play, mm. or that uh, what we talked about yesterday, there's a big slide on the playground which looks quite daunting, especially when you're standing on top of it, uh, that, um, that there is a real struggle for, for me. There was all, I, I went down it, but I had to th really think about it. <laughs> but for, for the children, you said for the children it's the same thing, you know, some, the, the, uh, a child might actually climb up there three or four or five times and, and, and not, not dare to jump down, and then, but one day they will, so there's kind of struggle going on. And the struggle is real. Utopian thinking is not about, it's not just about nice things. It's not to, mm -hmm. to deny the negativity or the struggle in, in, in the process of realization or, or of, of, of creation, but it's uh, to, to, to engage with it. Yeah. So, in terms of this project, it's really interesting. So, if you're exploring utopia and play, and the Adventure Playground is part of a project and you're using blockers as, as kind of frame of study. Um, and for block, hopes and dreams and desires can often be just kind of escapist fantasy and they need to be educated and trained. Then is there like a utopian role for the play worker in that? Kind of does a play worker become some kind of blocky and utopian educator, utopian guy? Utopian utopian like a, like a, like a in Plato's Republic, but uh, but uh, yeah, that's a good one. I think. I mean, I think, I think on a good on a good day, I think yeah, I love it too, but on a good day, it's kind of it's not really. I mean, it's just to think about things from a slightly different angle for maybe ten minutes. I think it's it's not that there's right and wrongs. It's just a maybe just a you know we're doing stuff with the kids, artists working there, really interesting stuffs happening, interesting stuffs happening anyway, and maybe just stuff like today. It's a bit weird. 
but just to kind of looking at something from a different angle for a morning mm. is kind of what universities does in some ways. And I think it's maybe not, we're not really doing research around utopia and block on the playground, we're just putting them together for a bit and seeing like what happens and what, what trajectories come out and what goes back. And I don't think it'll be massive, it's not a massive project, but it's quite an interesting way of looking at working in partnerships and building on the work that the architecture students have done. I mean, there's a kind of, the, what's really interesting, I, I interviewed some of the people that set the playground up and the building at the playground was designed by um, an MH student in 1980 and it was her first building and that was built in 1980. So there's a big history of those connections going back but I think it's, it is practice, it's the practical meeting the place and doing something worthwhile which feels kind of quite utopian. And I think yeah. everybody involved in the playground gets that feeling, however little you volunteer, if it's just baking a cake or just popping in and having a chat with people, that being able to contribute through that place, through building or playing or working there, is kind of um, it's a good thing to, to be happening. It's a good thing for ideas to be involved in as well, and different sorts of ideas, not just ideas about play work or structured work or historical ideas, but actually getting down dirty and moving 11 tonnes of sand. I don't, can, I, yeah, can I build on that a little bit, just, just to add a few points, a philosophical point to that? Because I think the question comes back, what, what does it mean to learn how to play? What does it mean, and that's almost the same as what does it mean to learn how to hope, as it were, how does doc, doctor space? And um, for, certainly for blocks, uh, well, you know, in the project maybe not, but for me certainly important background. Um, and, and Bloch was, of course, a Marxist philosopher. So he had this, uh, like you say, he had this idea we have to transform society from, from time immemorial. Society has been based on creating class divisions in which there are those who are in power and those who are oppressed. And we are now finally at, uh, at a point in time where we have come to understand how this works and therefore we are able to, to change it and to make uh, a, to create a society which is not based on the fact that one group dominates uh, the other. And um, Marx says himself in a, in a wonderful uh, uh, short paragraph from one of his writings, he says, uh, you know, that's what he calls communism. Communism means that, that we order society in such a way that it's not based on, on, on mutual exploitation. Um, and he says, we, we, the, the communism knows that this is true. <laughs> And it, and it knows itself to be the, the, the culmination or the end of, of history, of the struggle, uh, what, what Marx and later comes to call prehistory. Finally, when we have reached that world in which people are no longer mutually exploiting each other, that's when history can begin. That's when we can begin to find out what it means to be a human being. And that's open. We don't know where that's going to go. So we have to keep that open. Uh, if you are a committed Marxist, then, then you have to keep open the idea that human, the human, human future, and when, once we get it going, is, is radically unknown. It's an adventure. It's an adventure playground. <laughs> Society has to become an adventure playground for us. Huh? And, and um, when Bloch talks about learning how to hope, this Dr. Spess, he, he's talking about two things, which he calls the warm stream and the cold stream. And he says this, this Marxist engaged practice of hoping and hoping in an active transformative way has got on the one hand the critical cold gaze on the structures of domination and exploitation. That's why we need uh, economics, that's why we need political theory, that's why we need radical politics. So it's, it has this cold stream. You, you cannot hope in an effective way, it just becomes an escapist daydream if you don't see with cool eyes what's actually happening. But at the same time, he says, there's a warm stream in utopian thinking or in Marxist thought. And the warm stream is the connection to these utopian images, these pre-illuminations, as he calls them, of what human life might be. And we have them throughout culture, going right back to the beginning of, 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 of written and documented culture. There have been these images and hopes, fantasies about all the potentials in, in human life. The pirate, uh, ch children love to play pirates, and, and um, 
also in my for me I don't know if people here read Pippi or Longstockings but uh, that was for me that was the big you know like yeah and she she her father was a pirate and uh, <laughs> and the figure of the figure of the pirate in, uh, um, embodies in a way these two elements of the warm stream and the cold stream because the pirate is a thief the pirate the pirate robs uh, so the pirate uh, already understands that the division of property and the distribution of wealth is not okay the way it is <laughs> that the pirate uh, the pirate gladly takes uh, from from the rich who sail their ships uh, over the sea um, but at the same time so the pirate has the has the cold stream but the pirate also has the warm stream because the pirate goes into unknown lands and, and travels goes out into the world into places that nobody's ever been so the pirate is a very nice image to uh, also in a political sense, you know, the, the, the pirate is a kind of guiding image, and Bloch talks a lot about these archetypes of guiding images um, that, that, that help us without already painting in quite a, quite a bit of detail what this, what this open hum human future might look like. So learning how to hope uh, has to be both about the cold stream and about the warm stream. And maybe this warm stream has got a lot to do with play. Yeah, so when you say we have to teach the children how to play, maybe maybe that's what you have to have to connect them with. And then you can ask the question, okay, so how do you do that? How how do you train the? How do you? I think the word training that that you use is very interesting. How do you train the? I would say the cold stream is something that needs to be trained, and the warm stream is something that needs to be allowed to to unfold. And uh, and uh, and those are two slightly different attitudes. The, the, the cold stream has to do with education, knowledge, science, getting to know things, understanding how things work, understanding the causal connections in the world. Whereas the, the warm stream has got to do with creativity and imagination with allowing things to be. And um, there you can see the, the, how, how clever Bloch is in using this term, Dr. Spass, learned hope, because it is a reference to uh, a philosophical idea that uh, comes from um, an, uh, Cousanus, Nicholas of Cusa, an uh, 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 early Renaissance uh, German thinker, who has, the, uh, who has a phrase in his writings in Latin, docta ignorantia, which means learned ignorance. He says that the point of philosophy is to, as Socrates already says about himself, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but uh, the, the Greek philosopher Socrates says that, we have to learn, we have to know that we don't know. <laughs> What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing that you don't know. Um, and, uh, and that means knowing all the things you don't yet know, but that you might know, but also means that there is something in our relation to ourselves and to the world that has got nothing to do with knowing, that is an unknowing. So we have to, so philosophy is on the one hand building up knowledge and insight, and on the other hand it's also breaking down things. And, and this Dr. Ignorantia has, combines these two things. Again, I had to think of this in the context of uh, uh, Eastern philosophy, where you get the same idea in the Tao Te Ching, this book by Lao Tse, um, or it's not, but yeah, there, there is a wonderful phrase which says, if you want to, if you want to, uh, so gaining knowledge means adding something every day. And finding the way back to the path, to the Tao, means removing something every day. <laughs> so, you, so it's those two things together. And I think this phrase, Dr. Spess, when you apply it to the cold stream and warm stream of utopian thinking, also, in com also in company, uh, uh, embodies these two things. Take knowing where you need to know, but also realizing where you need to unknow, unlearn. And learning how to play is, I think, belongs in that latter, latter category. It's, it's about unlearning so that things can come up again. Yeah. So I think that's how I would try to say that these two things actually really need, need each other yeah? and can never be just one. Yeah. And just sort of in a similar way, so I come from an education background. I, I was a primary school teacher in a year one classroom. And I think it's just really interesting what you were saying about sort of unlearning and stuff because it feels to me that children naturally play. Yeah. Then you get to year one, you have to leave your imagination by the door and you sit down at your desk and so you're you know, being taught how, or sort of like, you unlearn how to play. And that's why you're fighting so hard to sort of teach them how, to, or to relearn how to play, because it's, I mean, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but I feel very strongly that um, schools are 
absolutely intent on play belongs between 10.30 and 10.45 in the playground and not inside this room. Yeah. And, um, and it's yeah, sort of one of the, it's obviously not a, a written in the curriculum or anything, but it is absolutely a tacit message that you're not allowed to play a play seen as a bad thing. It's seen as wasting time and so on. And, um, yeah. I mean, it is tragic, but <laughs> it's yeah got a huge implication. And even within schools, because I've worked with play settings in schools, um, even then they've got, they've, there's rules around it in many yeah. schools. So again, it's not play like you can get on, what we hope you can get on the adventure program, what yeah. we're trying to create there. Yeah. You were saying with your, your when you introduce yourself, your school's mm. classes with just like lots of different languages. So I'm thinking of, is it Rancieri who studied Jacto and the, the ignorant schoolmaster about, and that's like a playfulness to say, I'll step back, mm. and these people can kind of teach themselves and each other um, because they've got different ideas, different knowledges, and gaps. And yeah. Yeah. Well, the ignorant schoolmaster, and I've got to think about that. That's a really interesting point, actually. It is quite a playful approach, yeah. isn't it? I was just thinking what yeah. you're on the same about accepting what accepting we don't know things and embracing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah there's um, similarly in hospitals there's a there's a place for play also. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. seen as on the ward. You don't it, it plays quite mischievous if children play on the ward. Mm -hmm. So they can play when they're with a play therapist or when they go to the play room. Mm -hmm. And um, but I found that it's very interesting because children will always find a way to play. And um, I remember this this um, story isn't part of the study I'm doing, but I remember the child was excluded from the playroom because they couldn't get him in there, and um, and he he was paralysed, so he couldn't join in in the painting and um, things that were taking place in the playroom. And he sat in the bed and imagined that he was the king of this massive palace called a hospital, and that if he pressed the red if he pressed the button, he had servants that came to oh. all these ethnicals. So even though it wasn't quite allowed to play on the play on the ward, yeah. he imagined his yeah. play and it was kind of silent to everybody else. And I thought that that was very interesting because children always find a way to make this to make it playful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's a beautiful so, um, example. Yeah, and yeah. it is even in the children's hospital there are se yeah. segregated play spaces or play people who control children's play. And yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, you used this term in the beginning, but in both of these examples, that something comes across of play being always transgressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and then we try to say, well, you can't transgress, you have to learn not to transgress. Mm -hmm. And so this unlearning, I think that's very helpful, this unlearning is also finding, finding a connection back to, to our natural transgressiveness. Mm -hmm. you know, there, and there's no, there's, there's no play without it, but there's also no, no, no spirit without it. So you can't, you know, there is something, yeah. I think that's often when play seems political, mm. is because it is about breaking down those boundaries, yeah. and doing what's not expected of you, doing your mm. thing. And it, the adventure playground movement in the 70s was yeah. quite a political yeah. movement. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of handed down now to a society's attitude towards play um, and the lack of support and funding for, for play. Uh, as a whole, um, unless it's within the adult boundaries of the adult's definition of it, and uh, and I think you know we, we can be seen as quite subversive because we're actually getting children giving them the experiences that open up their minds and make them more free thinkers. Yeah. Um, and we 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 we've been quite political yeah, in the way we've operated, but we found it across the country in a lot of playwork settings is people are reluctant to be be seen as political um, because of you know the negativity and trying to get funding and everything. But I think it's inherent within what plays about for children, mm -hmm. certainly the age group we work with and what we're doing. Um, and we think we're trying to promote that and there's other people across the country that are trying to get the sector itself to be more political um, 
in terms of making those demands because children don't can't make those demands, they're not voters, they're overload. And I think it's really important like, because it feels like there's a consensus about the importance of play and then we, we have at schools we have play being squeezed at every level mm. and actually not many people, there's not much money, I mean I know we're talking generally about utopia but I don't hear many people, I mean on the news today someone's in court because they took the child out of school for a week and they were fined by the school and there's head teachers on the sort of saying, you know, if you don't get 95% of attendance, you're going to fail. And, you know, it's kind of like there's a massive weight on young people growing up at the minute and it squeezes those opportunities, you know. I mean, it's the same, I remember working with like, your young architects, I don't think there's any here, and I remember them sort of, I remember doing like a workshop which is very much sort of about structuring a space, thinking spatially, playing with materials. And about five or six of them, every year that I ran the workshop, were really angry that they were doing something that they saw as being pointless and being playful. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, they're quite happy to sit and have someone draw a picture of a perch and show you where the golden section is on it, or do a Fibonacci sequence. It's like absolutely eight information, but to actually play with materials and to make, which is fundamental. I mean. But spending eight years looking at space and buildings and movement, mm. but there was very little play in the in the first year students when they get there. It kind of, I mean, it felt like the first year was an unlearn, unlearning process yeah. for your students to allow yeah, them to I think, play. I, mean, it's, uh, I think the notion of utopia is actually very mm. challenging within architecture and design because a lot of people have to inhabit an architect or designer's version of utopia mm. and how they are then able to make it their own utopia is a real challenge and you do get a lot of conflict and as, a, as an architect or as a designer it can be very frustrating to see someone misuse and misinterpret in your view your idea of utopia but actually like say play has to be transgressive it has to be subversive i mean if one of the really lovely kind of coincidences of working at pittsburgh was finding out that myself and patrick both grew up in Wittenshaw, same part of manchester which is a utopian vision. It's a garden suburb. It stems from the Ebenezer Howard idea of uh, garden villages, garden towns. Mm. And, it, and it's kind of, if I look back to the way we used to play, because it's a garden suburb, there's lots of green space, there's lots of trees, there's lots of places where it's been designed that you will play there. But the most prevalent form of play, I don't know if it's the same way you were, but we used to do something called hedge hopping or garden, yeah, patrol, garden patrol, where because everyone had a back garden, <laughs> and you would go through the back garden, gardens, <laughs> jumping over fences, yeah. trespassing yeah. in people's houses. Yeah. And that was yeah. the most fantastic thing. Yeah, and I, right. I've, ne I've, I've never reflected on it before <laughs> as to what we were learning, but I've been thinking about it here. And you were learning that you were dependent on the group of people you were with. You couldn't do it on your own. You could enjoy it on your own for one thing, but you couldn't actually. You know, you need people to help you over fences, give you a leg up. We, as we got older, we had to make it more difficult, so we started doing it on our bikes. So you had to throw your bike over the hedge, <laughs> then follow up your bike, cycle across yeah. the garden, throw up your bike, and, it, and it was kind of. I mean, I've still got scars all over my lower legs from jumping over walls yeah. and falling into barbed wire and yeah. things like that. Was that just in the show then? We didn't do it in long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was because it was a garden suburb, everyone had yeah, a back yeah. garden, and you could yeah. work your way along the street through the back garden. Mm. And it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Green houses were the common yeah. common yeah. You should go back and do it as part of your project. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be a great thing we, to do. We used to have a thing called either. Follow the Dog because there was a lot of stray dogs. You had to go where the dog went. Through a little hole, through gardens, yeah. you got your leg. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that that was preferable and much more enjoyable and probably a greater learning experience than using the playground that had been designed. It'd been master planned that there's the playground, that's where the kids will go. We didn't want to go there. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so exactly. You, you, want, you want to find a place where you shouldn't be, yeah. And the fact that the yeah. play that we thought we'd invented, everyone was doing all that. <laughs> 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 it's, really it, it's kind of just a really lovely thing. It's really know? interesting that there's this daring aspect to play. And yeah. again, I, yeah. I see it in hospitals, so whether it's from the top of a slide and daring yourself to go down it or daring yourself to not get caught um, jumping through people's gardens or playing knock a door rock. Um, it takes on like a, another feel in the hospital. So the 
I, this is a story from when I was younger, actually. When I was in the hospital, I was scared of needles, and I needed to have um, one of the cannulas put in my hand. And usually I would, like, say, no, I don't want that. I don't really, really not want to have it until my sister came and said, I dare you. Go on, I dare you. <laughs> and, of course, I had to do it then because yeah. she's younger than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It made it a lot easier to yeah. be in, I don't know, Chelsea? be in this world rather than being, oh, it could, could hurt, it could do this, it yeah. could do this. Yeah. So I think there's that movement through your imagination as well and through, yeah. through I think there's time. Dead. There's a lot of back and forth movements when yeah. playing, yeah. Uh, especially mentally. And it's really yeah. interesting, the idea of daring yeah. and using, I don't know, is it scared, being scared yeah. to play? So. Yeah, that's right. I think daring is absolutely fundamental. Yeah, and, and how to how to confront your fears, mm. you know, live with your fears and, and and look look them in the eye and and try something that you haven't done before that you don't dare to do. Yeah, yeah. dare and uh, you know, Kant also says uh, philosophy is also like that. Dare to know, you know. <laughs> yeah, he says that like, literally. Yeah. yeah. In the, going back in order to create utopia, you need right mm. the movement, the adventure play, and the very political. We have to fight on. A whole load of what you could call dragons mm -hmm. to enable children to have a free, safe space to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to manage a whole range of situations for dream. people to have utopia. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, recently, even the Star said it, they did a double page feature, this is really good for Sheffield Star, and they called it a children's paradise. Yeah. And, yeah, and Kyle Walker, the Football, he used it. He might get selected, and I think they're in the selection for England today. He put the adventure playground where I learned everything. And the education comes in many forms and in different disciplines. Yeah. We need to remember uh, how we learn. I was fortunate to be with a gentleman called Joel Scarborough, who's a big supporter of the adventure playground. And uh, he went to Milnhurst School, which is the fee paying school up in the southwest side mm -hmm. of the city. And he's, he's got the great and the good there. It's their annual event, and he was chose to be the keynote speaker. He stands up and he says, "Forget education. I like to daydream. Look out the window all day. <laughs> I'm a professional artist." <laughs> and then he, he started to proceed about why he did it in a particular way, looking at dreams, aspirations, observations, and how it served him good, as well as also the educational aspect that helps him get through his life and to be one of the greatest artists Sheffield's ever had. Yeah. That's right. So there's a lot of transgression and a lot of daring necessary on the part of people who manage and, 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 and make sure that the playground is there and that it exists. And there's a lot of fighting or struggling that has to go on. But that's, and that's part of play. And uh, I think that's so interesting. So also us being together here today and talking about this and learning from your experiences is itself also a form of, of, of transgression. Is, as we this morning we played the song, um, the B song oh, yeah, in the car. Oh yeah, we played Nancy Kerr's B song because yeah. um, Nancy lives down the road and Patrick's mm. bees inspired the song. And yeah, yeah. Played it. And that was like yeah. It's, really it's, a, it's a wonderful song written by a local uh, f f folk musician about about bees mm. that feed on um, feed themselves on on Coca Cola, or had that was it that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind um, of a new idea that the Coca Cola is kind of part of capital. But they still it's free and it's the tins in the, in yeah, the cemetery. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so these these bees live in the cemetery and they feed on the Coca Cola and so the song is about how they how in this world of, of exploitation as it were they find the the, the cracks to, uh, to, uh, to 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 and I think the interesting thing that what made me think of this song is that one of the recurring lines is life finds a way. And maybe that 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 is uh, so. That's an example uh, of what we're talking about here today of this adventure playground of us sitting here and working out where where to go next is also itself an example of life finding a way. And I think that's maybe one of the, another element of play. Play is is what is play ultimately? It is this this aspect that life finds a way, however difficult it is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was just you know sort of. When some of the stuff I was reading about the adventure play movement from the 1940s, just after the war, there was this kind of idea that it was like a ruined generation, that the young, the, the, the children were often experienced such 
a sort of childhood that we weren't able to play. Mm. And the, the adventure playgrounds were almost like a remedial, mm. like a cure. But then, it's sort of at the end of the article, it kind of said it's this, this, it's a perception of the, the young person has been complicit in the problem that needs to be cured. And then the mm. idea that actually, if you the anarchy idea, that if you kind of create a space, it will self, as long as you know, young people will self-organise and they're not inherently part of the problem, that the system's part of the problem. What do you think about that, young man? Do you think there is that kind of attitude to young people? Because it feels like we've been schooling at the minute, although I don't know if, if anyone's explicitly saying it, it feels like you, the young people are seen as being bad before they start off. With, you know, yeah, 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 that's right. The I new think idea had been born and it's been a decline from birth. They've, 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 no, no, they've, they've been born bad and they need to be, they need to be, they need to be yeah, knocked into shape. You've been born bad and you need to be knocked, knocked into, into shape. shape. Yeah, I and think, then adventure yeah. play... I think it's true. And it's the opposite in a way. Yeah, so schooling is, is, is creating people who, who know yeah. how, to, how to conform. And, um, and um, I forgot who... Critical theorist, I forgot which one, an American educationist who said sc schooling is either a practice of liberation or it is uh, yeah, training to conform. Really ah, yeah, I, I forgot, but. Well, yeah, she's done stuff on yeah. and, and Well, and anyway, the, the, the idea is that you have to make a choice. When you are an educator, you either are engaged in the practice of liberation or whatever you do, in fact, ends up being training to conform and so there's a real choice to make you know and um, I think that that is uh, rings very true to me that uh, education can be both but but, uh, but so it can also be a practice of liberation but but mostly it is that but you see that I think also there are national differences I think if I'm allowed a, a criticism of English culture, <laughs> I think no, that, no, that, no. that I think that that, uh, <laughs> that there is a real uh, the, the, the if I put it in very broad terms, you know, the, the English have a real problem with kids. <laughs> so they, they, they don't like it. They want to be kids themselves because they were never allowed to be kids when they were small. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It's also demonization of children. Demonization of children. I'm doing a TED talk and I might do it about yeah. demonization of children. Yeah. You see a group of three or more, they want you off they the want street. They want off you the street, yeah, visible. exactly. You know, and they that's, don't that want you climbing trees, they don't want you... Yeah. yeah, and I think that is true. That, that is a general thing. It's it's not just here, but I do think there are still differences, and I experience very big difference between, let's say, Dutch culture in that respect and, and and English culture. And my children experienced it themselves when when they went from a Dutch school to an English school, and you know we got almost the second day we got calls from the from the school like and they talk back in class. So what is this? You know, <laughs> 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 it all stems from the 1970s and the great hedge destructions in Manchester. Yeah, that's what it's <laughs> 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 Put it into context, though, Steve. With the adventure playground more than being political, you've got to think at the time what was happening in the country mm. as a whole, because in that period where the the heyday of adventure playgrounds, we then got Thatcherism coming in. So the playground movement was as much a victim of Thatcherism as the miners were, because they, everything was against yeah. what what was being achieved, and and putting that foot down to stop. And oh, I'm going to get really political here, <laughs> but you know, basically, uh, a lot of the adventure playgrounds in working class areas, so they served working class children and. The movement, what happened was to clamp down on that because it was making, it was too radical for the establishment. Yeah. And they clapped down on it as much as they could, as, along with other things as well. Um, mm -hmm. As a parent in the area, my children were young at that time, it was, you knew that if you didn't have things like the adventure playground and other things that you did yourselves, that your children wouldn't have the same experiences that more affluent families could afford. And it was the only way in a community we could afford those things and give children those experiences uh, and create those. I was saying the playground was about creating memories, mm. um, you know, and, and to get them to move on and do greater things. And, you know, that was not, at that time, that was not what was the establishment wanted. They wanted people that knew the place and kept in the place and didn't challenge things. So it's got worse in things. Yeah. That, I mean, in terms of, I mean, it's just a withdrawal of funding. Mm -hmm. But you know, we could walk around, and there were quite a lot of 
security cameras that have cost yeah. tens of thousands of pounds that are watching all our streets. It's got there's still money to do things. It's just where mm -hmm. people choose to spend it. I think. But how do you how do you participate in them debating discussions when it's marginalised and there's a particular set of people who have been trained in a certain area that they're going to allocate the resources where they see fit. And I'd say we'd often talk about community cohesion and we've got a very cohesive community in Pittsmore and Moongreen at present. But a lot of the things that people do is to segregate and isolate and intimidate people and uneducate and turn them off from learning. And I, I, at times I struggle with that. So if you, if you ever get the chance to go to the adventure playground and see me pottering around, not saying the deal of things and watching and observing, and then outside of it for it to work, there's a team of people like you, Nina, and the other members of the board working hard to enable that facility to, to be mm. retained. Mm. And across the country, this is going against the grain. Mm. But, but I worked in local government for 16 years and I've got some understanding of the way systems work and I've just finished an MED. And it's the same with the board, they're all very well educated professional people. And that's why we can influence the change. And some of the things around block, I want our kids to be able to, to work in particular particular areas where they choose and see fit and then withdraw. Like last week we came around Jess and, and Rowan over there and Jess was getting interviewed, weren't you Jess? <laughs> what about our young people? Yeah. Grilled beautifully, weren't you? <laughs> and we, had a, we were just working, weren't we, on the Utopia Boxing. The questions he was pitching at, at all of us. You know, that's what you're trying to do is to equip people with the life skills as well as having fun in their Utopia. One minute they're having fun, and the next minute they'll switch on to something else. But it's for me, it's about the space and creating that opportunity for people to participate. And people from all different backgrounds coming together, and different ages, and lots of young parents, people who you would not normally get sat together, seem to be attracted to them adventure playgrounds for whatever reason. Mm. And it does want further research, doesn't it? Definitely. Well, I think it's what Johan said. It's, it's, you remember you, you remember the. Well, Johan talks a lot about the, the child, the imagined child that you never had, but it's intimately connected with the child that you did have, and you, you, you remember those moments, and it does connect you. But I do think there's a really simple thing that I, could, I, I was thinking the other day is everybody that, that's there have, have chosen to be there, and just mm -hmm. kids don't get to make that many choices about, you know, you've got your swimming lessons, you've got your learning to play your flute, or mm -hmm. whatever it is that you do, your own work. But you know, to actually think, oh, I'm going to go out to a sunny day, I'm going to go to the adventure playground and play. You get there, and you've met, before you even get in the door, you've made that decision yourself. Yeah. And I think it is, you know, it does make you think about the lack of decisions that we allow you people to make. And it's also make. about decisions within the playground. Yeah. You know, we have to question ourselves constantly and reflect yeah. on what we do, so that we're not putting those added boundaries in place, that we are trying to get up, stand back, and make sure that there's enough resources and different types of things around that children can then utilise in their own way and do it. And going back to the very beginning when you said about an artist making something, and I'm not against adults doing something, It what I am against is, a, is forcing children to do it if they don't want to do it. And one of the best ways I've found uh, of, of doing things with children in a play work setting is to just play yourself, do something, and they're curious, they come up and ask what you're doing, and, and that can spark other things happening. But if they don't do that, they don't do it. And if they don't want you as an adult interfering in their play, I'd much rather you did your own bit than interfere in what children are doing perfectly well without an adult. Yeah, I think there's times when, <coughs> sorry, a, a, a question sometimes, it's called Pittsmore Adventure Playground, sometimes I think it's, for me, it's like Pittsmore Adults Playground because yeah. my kids are grown and the stuff that I'll do on the playground or what the kids will do, it's like the utopia concept coming in again. Mm -hmm. It's like, I ain't done yet. <laughs> There's still things that I still want to play. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So I, sometimes I think, do I use these kids as a way of getting on here to, <laughs> to play in the dirt? Because when we played in the dirt, my mum would whack us. You know, she got six kids, no washing machine. Go in and get a backhand because she got out in your church clothes and got a black. Yeah. So, you know, there was a situation the other week uh, at a group of Rome Slovak um, young adults, 20s, 30s, came on the playground. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, this is for children. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so they went away, and then t 
Ten minutes late to the game by the children. Some of the projects I've done with Stephen Kate is that yeah. the artist is a, an adult, that is a person who can play and can give other people permission to play, maybe. This is something I've been talking about with some of the artists on yeah. the projects I've done. Is, and I'm seeing this at the moment when we're going into schools and they, you know, it's literacy and numeracy and that's it. And they have to outsource an artist to come in and do creative things, but none of the teachers are allowed to do anything creative in the way that they deliver literacy and numeracy. Um, and it's just a complete kind of mess, but it's it's really funny just seeing how uh, some people are given the role, but they're allowed to be an adult and play and give other people permission to play, whether that's other adults or whether that's children, and how it's just being li limited more and more as to who is allowed to kind of think differently or think differently about their role. I might be being unfair to artists here, but this is something that we've been discussing about before. It's like we've been talking to some of the practitioners we work with and they say, well, I'm just giving people permission to play. But it's so sad that, you know, if someone has to come in and give you permission to play, you can't actually do anything in your day to day. You can't give life. anybody permission to do anything. They've got to take, I think that's the thing that's mm. about emancipation. You, ha you, can't, you can't allow children to play. They have to just be able to play. There's, because it's, it's like Johan was saying about a rule and anarchy. Once you start to have to have a rule, the utopian sort of program's kind of all stalled. So I think it's the idea of, I don't think it is the artist coming in and liberating, I think it's just like, the, often the artist is a bit of an outsider, and you need something from outside to legitimise a different way mm. to operate within a system that becomes quite closed. So I think the artist as shame on, or artist as, as a, the, where other people can use them as a way to liberate themselves, I don't think that is the point. I think the point is that some people like, Patrick, who we're working with at Adventure Playground, it's kind of all they can do is is make stuff. It's kind of in his blood, and he just makes stuff, and people join in. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, yeah, we can look at it. We can think, well, what role is, is is he in there? But then you just have to think, well, actually, it's sort of working, and make, let's just see what happens. Mm -hmm. But I think, just as an as an artist, I try not to say that. I kind of, I often think, well, what can what can art art do here? Mm -hmm. But there's also what can plague do here? What can utopia do here? What can fairy do here? What can architecture do here? What can building and making do here? It's not like artists is anything special, mm. but if you are one, then you sort of think, well, what can I, what can we do here? What can mm. artists art do here? What can culture do here? Because that's what I do. Mm. Whereas I think maybe what, collapsing that little bit and think, what can philosophy do here with, with art, with building, with play, with young people in this space? Maybe, you know, from this conversation, maybe this, this needs to be scaled. This conversation needs to be heard in schools because, you know, I would, I'm really worried about my grandchildren going to schools in the UK if something doesn't happen. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I would kind of question 
that it's about an absence of rules. I think it's about the rules being created from the bottom up rather than imposed from the top down. Because I think one of the key things that you learn in a place like uh, Pittsburgh Adventure Playground, and one of the key things you learn from play when you're in a group is that you can have your utopia as long as it doesn't, by its nature, deny someone else having their utopia. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that architects are very bad at when they create their vision of the utopia. It very often denies and stops happening someone else's idea of utopia. And I think it, it's it's learning that that you can have your version of reality, but you mustn't stop someone else having theirs. And I think that creates a bottom-up set of rules within play, where where people learn that aspect of negotiation, collaboration, that, that actually they need to be to be not creating an environment which is then hostile to other people. But those are constantly, like, like they're, they're saying, saying, constantly they're not, they're not rules movement. you could write down, but they are rules. But those, yeah, and that kind of, children learn then that, that a version of an equitable society relies on the same bottom up set of rules where what you do in your life doesn't stop someone else doing what they want to do in their life which are, I guess top-down rules are essentially doing, but they become so uh, kind of draconian in how they're implemented that it loses that sense of ownership of the rules. Uh, and I think it's it's kind of, you know, to be able to have shared ideas of utopia where every idea can be different relies on them being able to run along side by side. The, it's interesting that the, the most kind of utopian architects in recent years are, they, they did, they were obsessed with adventure playgrounds and playgrounds, so oh, there's oh, Kid Graham in the 60s who almost, they just kind of squeeze themselves out of the architectural world because they're not, you know, they're trying to be utopian and they're not, and I think they, they did build two things, one was an adventure playground at Milton Keynes, it's just <laughs> been knocked down, the, the other thing was a guitar shapes room pool for a rock star, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there was people like, Cedric Price, he had a project called Fun City in London, which was in the 60s again, mm -hmm. like an adventure playground. So it is this, and then recently this, there's this, this, this brutalist playground, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. So that was, it's quite frightening to look at because it's, it's the it's the brutalist architects who then just had this playground, which was just like concrete blocks. And yeah, I've seen, I've seen it. I and you, you, you think, oh gosh, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of, if you don't like brutalism as a real thing, you know, no, never mind it's quite fashionable, but thinking I've got to live there. And then you look at that and think, my kids, or I've got to play there. But then the kids did play there. They they had the capability to to make narratives and adventure out of this quite stark, you know, quite stark materials. And so it is, it's, it's it's quite, you know, it's with, with, with regarding architecture, there is mm. things there to look at. I guess yeah. Carolyn would know that she's not. Do you know, in terms of utopia as well, we're talking about qualities and fairness for, for all, but life's not like that, and society's not like that, is it? No, that's, that, that's, that's the challenge. So It can be today. Just for, for this one, but it's a challenge, isn't it, across, mm. yeah. across, across the country as well as the world and the city. You know, I would suggest the work that we, we do with our particular cohort of children is quite valuable. And there's a difference in terms of class and society, the way they view things. Of course, yeah. there, There's a massive pessimism now. So you, you were talking about hope. So then yeah. you, you look now, cool. writers like Frederick Jameson, his, his quote is, it's, it's easy now to, to, to kind of think of the end of the world and to think of a better world, you know, and that's mm -hmm. probably quite true. Like who Lebec is novel atomized, which is based on the failure of utopia, you know, in the 60s generation. And it's, yeah, it's quite, it's very pessimistic. You've been yeah. reading too many books, you want to get out more. <laughs> You've got to write some <laughs> 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 like <this. laughs> <laughs> really if you're utopian. <laughs> well, there's still a big, a big, massive play movement that I came to safeguard play and provision. Yeah. I would imagine if you did further, as Steve says, scale up your van about discussions and care about play and utopia, a lot of the people involved with play would say play and utopia have got a very, very close connection. Yeah. I'm interested That's right. in, 
has the narrative for games changed quite a lot in recent years with the site? Because we talk about all, all the influence of violent video games to younger people. Have you seen anything change in terms of... I'm Do you want to Cowboys and Indians? When we were children, yeah, we, had, we did Cowboys and Indians. Project. And we had this one where we all lined up on a hill and you had to think of how you were going to die, and it might be a grenade or a laser, <laughs> and the best acting out was <laughs> 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 So, I mean, I guess there's something there. It's <laughs> quite like this, quick. I think sometimes children emulate TV programmes yeah. play. That changes, obviously, in terms of what they're watching, but... Um, I, I, on the whole, the main principles of types of play still remain the same. So, sort of the, you know, yeah, pirates, you know, that might turn into a real ad, killing the dragon, don't we, and yeah. things like that. So there's <coughs> still sort of a violent sort of play, like Cowboys and Indians was. It's just mm. a different vehicle for it. Um, and my kids, he used to play car crash. I don't see them doing I set a kids playing Kirby the other day and I thought, yeah. hey, wow. Kirby. And I thought, yeah. wow. Yeah. We used to be, we used to get battered because we were told to be in at ten, even though it was still on the mum's front playing Kirby. We couldn't stop. It's an addictive yeah, game. Really addictive. And I saw a few kids playing it not that long ago and I, I, I stood there like a right idiot like <laughs> I must have thought she was a bit simple. <laughs> I just, it was just a, something that was amazing to see that somebody yeah. else's child was doing yeah. what I did all them years ago yeah, exactly. without it's me it's having to teach them. You know what's funny about that is probably because I'm probably a bit younger. I actually don't know what, when you say Kirby, for me it reminds me of a, like a Game Boy game where you play no, no. Kirby. Kirby's <laughs> already there. So. <laughs> Sorry, I should have been. Kirby's where you got a ball, like a football, yeah? yeah? And if you've got two sides, of, you've got a Kirby here and a Kirby there. One friend stands here, yeah. one friend stands there. You've got to hit the kid with the ball so it bounces back. Exactly. If you catch it, yeah. you get another goal. <laughs> and, it's, and it's up to ten. But it's actually a brilliant because I would play it today. I would rather play Kirby than play on a PlayStation 4. Can I just ask a question? You know, where could where can you go with your children where you can sort of, and like Holly was saying about imaginative playing, and, and, uh, where can you go where you can have water fights? Where you can have fire, where you can have a mud kitchen, no, where you can get to. messy as a family, yeah. and you can still clean up, and you can go, and you can, you can dream, and you can have aspirations, and you can have ambitions. Mm, you just mentioned the video games. I think if we uh, take uh, the uh, visual world, the visual playground mm -hmm. into account as a playground, maybe many children think mm -hmm. the uh, visual world uh, is a kind of Utopia and um, Utopia place. Um, yeah. in, in the context of China, many children, uh, especially the school children, are addicted to the video games, the visual, visual world, because they have less chance to get access to the real playgrounds. They have high pressure, uh, pressure of the homework, the extra courses after school, so they they uh, they find the way to get like in, um, uh, engage with the playground, like the video, uh, video games. Mm -hmm. And in that world, like you just said, they can be what they want to be, um, mm -hmm. and they cannot be in the real world. Like they can find more confidence in the visual world, not in the real world. They can like uh, organize a team group. They can lead that group, but they can never do it in the real world. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think for many children, yes, maybe in the real world, they can find the utopia place to play. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. the, the problem is that they cannot control themselves. They can just get lost in that real world. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to uh, communicate with a real person. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think maybe the education, maybe the educator should consider how to get give a, like get the right direction to these students? Maybe uh, consider rethink the curriculum in school, because like in China, playing is playing, learning is learning. It's like 
separated yeah. 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 So, um, so you know, it, the pl playing is kind of prize for the students. Like the, the, the parents will say, oh, you have a good performance or achievement in your yeah. exams. So you can play now <laughs> for, se for, several, uh, for uh, several hours or for uh, how, how long so it's like a prize to encourage people, uh, to encourage the children to perform better in the mm -hmm. academic yeah. achievement. Yeah. Yeah. So That's I the world upside down. Yeah. 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 That's right. Oh, yes, we're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. That's just, very helpful. Yeah. I'm aware sure. of time. We officially yeah. said we stop around midday. I don't know if Carolyn's coming this week. I'll look at the telephone. But um, I'm just thinking we've kind of yeah. had this wonderful, rich discussion, which has been yeah. amazing. Um, and I'd really like to thank everybody because it felt like we did yeah, create good. something together. Yeah, and we yeah. kind of played together in a kind of way that I think is really special in the university. I think it's quite hard to get these spaces. Um, I really like to thank you three because I think what you contributed you. was fantastic yeah. and I think we learned from you but also it's really good because we had a mix of people in the room which is great from architecture and education and a mix of people's experience so I thought that was really lovely. Thank you. Patrick, we'll just see if we can get into the town centre without ruining any room. Yeah. <laughs> 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 changing the city, I'm going to speak with the town planner. He had his arm up with him. What was that playing around the city? You want to tell me my utopia project, and I'm going to carve utopia, utopia yeah. into my hedge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.